This is Steven with Knife TV at the Art Knife Invitational. We're sitting with the world famous Michael Walker. Michael, nice to have you here. Good to be here, Steven. Thanks. How long have you been making knives, Michael? Uh, the show in Miami in May, I brought my 35th anniversary knife. I started on January the 1st, 1980. I uh, built a little log cabin workshop. I was selling firewood for a living. On January the 1st, I walked into that shop, said, today I'm a knife maker, and I started making scrap to throw in a bucket. How'd you get started? What were you thinking? Um, Patricia bought me a copy of the Blade magazine. And, that, and that's your former wife? My former wife. She was my partner engraver. Um, and she bought me a copy of a Blade magazine. I had no idea people were making knives. I thought of knives as something, you know, made in a factory. So that sort of set a set a spark, but uh, it took some years before I could get to a place. Get you know, you you need a place to work. Uh, uh, I moved back to New Mexico. I was in California at the time. Uh, moved back to New Mexico, living up in the mountains. Built a little eight by sixteen log cabin, and that was my workshop. And went in on January and started seeing what I could figure out. So you are popularly create. Uh, credited for creating the liner lock, and when was that? Uh, and the liner lock, eighty-one. I made the liner lock, nineteen eighty-one. Um, I made uh, ten straight knives, hunting knives, and uh, a friend of mine had a little shop, a little town of Red River, where he sold fishing license, fishing supplies, and uh, so he could sell sell the knives and uh, I took him the 10 hunting knives and he said great we could probably sell them but you need to make the sheaths so I went to Tandy Leather bought all the tools the supplies all the stuff and I think I spent longer making those sheaths and it was just aggravating work for me it wasn't pleasurable at all so when I took those back I said you know I, I really don't care for this man you know it's uh, this is uh, not my <laughs> leather's not my thing he said, well, if you make folding knives, you won't have to make any sheaths. So that was, that was the end of the hunting knives. So uh, trial and error and um, lockbacks, lots of slip joints, lots of utility slip joints. Uh, um, then I made Vasco wear blades and stuff that were really made for using, using tools and slip joints. But because I was working with no, uh, no uh, modern tools at all, just basically uh, my jewelry making tools and a belt grinder, I was looking for uh, a lock I could make with those simple tools that we could open and close with one hand and without reposition in the knife in, in the hand. And that was where uh, the experimentation with that came to that, that first liner lock. Because um, I could make that with a jeweler's saw, I could split the liner with a jeweler's saw, rivet on some bolsters, handle, and good to go. You know, uh, do it with more traditional hand jewelry making tools. So you went from liner locks, and was it around the same time that the anodizing and the tight? How did how did you get into titanium, and how did you get into anodizing it, and then engraving it? Well, th that that came some years later, probably '84, somewhere in the in that range. Um, the first the first liner locks all had 440C springs, and um, stainless or nickel silver uh, was popular at that time. Bolsters. But I uh, was, you know, always looking for those other other materials, and uh, um, you didn't just uh, go get some titanium at that point. You know, um, you, you uh, chasing down titanium was was quite a chore. And I finally found some scrap pieces from a company and tried it to see if it would work uh, for uh, for the frame and and for the liner for the bolsters and. Um, it seemed to work well, and then it, it some uh, a little time later when the anodizing came along, the jewelers were already, uh, the jewelry trade was already doing uh, some of that. So I thought, you know, let's uh, let's add a little color to the knives and see what happens. And so, if you could take us uh, chronologically, sort of, so we made the liner locks first, and then you got into the anodizing and the use of titanium. And as far as I know. You're one of the first guys to use titanium in, in a folding knife. Well, usually I'm credited with making the first uh, titanium folding knives. But um, that, uh, actually, Ron Lake 
Ron Lake made several of the of uh, the inner his inner frame styles, and some years later actually gave me the rest of that sheet of titanium. But of course, he wasn't colored, and and no one knew uh, knew that, you know. But uh, I did bring the anodizing, but you know we got to credit Ron with uh, making those that first uh, titanium. Uh, he used that in his in his inner frames. But uh, the, using the liner, the titanium liner, uh, uh, functionally, you know, it makes a perfect spring. It was just a lightweight, high tech. Uh, didn't have to heat treat it or anything. So um, you know, it's uh, carried on. You know. And you 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 didn't use uh, like screws back then. I, I as far as the earliest pieces that I've seen from the 80s, you were using Allen head screws. No, before that, they were uh, the first ones were all riveted together. Traditional, you know, pocket knife uh, riveted together. The um, and even the inner frames that I were doing were two pieces. Jeweler saw out a hole, fit an inlay, put the two pieces together, riveted them together, and, and run it off. But um, later, when I moved to the titanium, um, you see the. You can sort of get a little uh, time thing. You'll see some of the titanium bolsters, but it still had stainless uh, screws. Once I'd gone to the screw construction, and it took a little time later to where I could uh, get set up to where I could make uh, make a titanium pivot screw, and that that came uh, mid '80s. Uh, okay, and then from there, you've made so many different mechanisms. Let's talk a little bit about the blade lock or the bl the blade lock with the zipper. When did that come about? Um, well, I patented the I patented the blade lock and I patented the zipper in 1990, uh, but it was a few years later that I uh, incorporated the two together. The zipper blades um, from the late 80s were li liner locks in, in you know s several sizes, but uh, the liner lock actually creates a, a big problem with the zipper because the ball detent has to run across the zipper joint. Which is a titanium back, which gets a, a groove exactly. running across it. Two pieces, and the ball's going across. The, the ball's fine going across the hardened steel, but it doesn't like riding across the titanium. So, um, I, I'm guessing it was either the '93 Art Knife Invitation or maybe the '95 Art Knife Invitational when I incorporated the blade lock and the zipper, and so both of those, you know, that knife carried two patents, one on the one on the blade and one on the locking system. And Michael, uh, for those of us uh, that, or for those out there that don't know it, you are the first contemporary folder maker to break that $100,000 ceiling per piece. How does that feel? What do you think about that? Well, that's, I didn't, I didn't know that was a, uh, uh, but yeah, that was a, uh, that was, uh, I'm going to say my, uh, my, the most complicated zipper I'd made, and that was um, uh, a, a, a very special time, very special show, and, and uh, yeah, it was a, it's a good feeling to know that uh, that things have changed so much uh, in the, in this industry over these years. What do you what do you feel What do you feel your legacy is? What do you think about all the people that have have credited you for the the different mechanisms and the different styles that you've worked with? Yeah, I'm very appreciative of that to see you know you you work it's to be uh, you know to be appreciated what you do is uh, what dr drives us to keep going without the collectors you can make the greatest thing there is if we don't have this group of collectors that appreciate what you do and can do it you can't go home and make the next one you know um, so I'm very appreciative for the collectors and everybody that sees uh, sees where I put my energy for sure if you could go back uh, 40 years and make some changes or do some things differently what would you do yeah, you know I can't think that I would uh, it's been for me it's been a, it's always been a, that journey's a learning learning experience I'm I was all about the trial and error and trying to always trying to find that next thing for me that sort of keeps me keeps me uh, going with it, it um, so uh, yeah, I, I think it uh, I've been very lucky the way things have gone and uh, it's been a lot of work and uh, you know in a, this this cu custom knife thing where you've got to travel and meet a lot of great people uh, I, I still I don't do as many shows but that's when I go and I see my friends that I you know you only see a few times a year uh, it's been a, it's been a great run well this is Stephen 
with Knife TV at the Art Knife Invitational. I want to thank Michael Walker for coming out to talk with us. Any last words, Michael? No, good to be here, and thanks, Stephen. Thank you.